All right, welcome everybody to the next episode of the Digital Marketing Agency Builders podcast. Today I have with me Skylar Reeves. Skylar is the founder and CEO of Ardent Growth, a consultancy dedicated to multi-channel content marketing for entrepreneurs and agency owners. Skylar has also worked as the CMO of Run Doen, where he was instrumental in transforming their conversion rate from a 2.2 to an 18.5 in just 30 days and doubling their revenue in the first quarter. In 2019, Skylar founded Ardent Growth, where their focus on content intelligence and financial modeling brings transformative growth to their clients, adding millions in revenue. Skylar and his team by, live by a simple mantra, which is be fucking legendary. They are defined by the pursuit of growth and the belief that real process stems from embracing risks, learning from failures, and ne never settling for mediocrity. Skylar, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Thanks for having me, Tyler. Glad to be here. Absolutely. Did I say those names right? Ardent Growth and, and Run Doen? Uh, so it's uh, Run Doyen, I believe is the way. Run Doyen. Uh, Doyen, it's a, uh, I think it's a Greek word. It basically means I'll like be honest uh, with you. coach. That was, that was the one that I was like, okay. Um, yeah. uh, I probably should have asked before we before we started the episode, but okay, I'm glad you cleared that up for the listeners. So Skylar, you, um, I mean, you have uh, some pretty impressive credentials. I have a lot to ask you um, about the growth of agencies. We're going to talk about three major fronts, lead gen, uh, fulfillment, and sales, uh, and some other things as well. But I also did just want to kind of ask you in your own words, kind of how you ended up where you are today. I always love hearing people's entrepreneurial stories. Were you always an entrepreneur? Did you used to work? in a job and then had to break out what's your entrepreneurial breakout story yeah i mean i think i've i've had a bit of an entrepreneurial spirit i guess for my entire life it was uh i mean even from being like a kid selling like you know just art that i would make for people or stuff like that in like fourth fifth grade like on up through high school and, and whatnot and then i went and spent some time in the military uh did a bit of a uh, gallivanting over in the desert for a bit in iraq and whatnot and around the the horn of africa and then I uh, realized after uh, after enough of that chaos, I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go get educated. So went to college, uh, worked a normal job for about two years after college, um, and then realized that uh, basically I'd asked him for a raise. I said, hey, uh, it was, it's funny looking back on it now because I was working on um, algorithms, things like that. Uh, background was in computer science. And uh, I'd asked for a a uh, $60,000 salary and they just couldn't do it. And so I was, I said, okay, I'm out of yeah. here. And I just went yeah. and started my own thing. Right. And and now I couldn't imagine um, ever going back, but uh, definitely didn't have any sort of formal training in business, you know, and uh, something I regret to some extent is not getting a bit more experience, um, uh, kind of understanding business, understanding, uh, you know, corporate uh, leadership management, things like that. But yeah, that's what entrepreneurs do. I guess we just kind of figure it out and, you know, build it as we, as we, uh, build a plane on the way down. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you had, this was a raise you asked for, or this was a salary coming in that you asked for and they turned it, it down. It was, it was a raise. It was a raise. And, uh, I'd been working with them for a bit, had made the company quite a bit of money by solving some, um, basically in the world of, it was in logistics. So we were just a lot of times there, if you solve something to do with routing, uh, whether it's fuel costs, savings, et cetera, right? Like you can, dr you know, dramatically add to the bottom line. And uh, I guess they, you know, at the time it was the culture, it was the culture really just, they didn't have a culture of, uh, of rewarding performance or anything like that. And yeah, so but I feel like a, a lot of company, us, but a lot of us entrepreneurs have a, a similar villain story of like, just, you know, not feeling that underappreciation, that not mm -hmm. value and knowing how much value we are bringing to the company and being like, okay, finally that flip, flip, that switch flips where we're like, okay, I could do this for way more on my own because I, I, you know, know my value. Um, yeah. So you have helped uh, multiple agencies grow from seven figures to eight figures. Uh, and I want to break down kind of what is going right and what is going wrong on three big fronts for agencies that you've worked with and that you see. So the three fronts are lead generation, fulfillment, and sales. I'm a firm believer that, you know, if you can, if you're an agency and you can get these three things right, then you have a, you know, you have your machine got running uh, fairly smoothly. So first, what are the winners doing right in lead gen? And what are the, I guess, the others not doing so right in lead gen? Yeah, I'd see. So it, it, it varies to some extent, but I think that there's there's a few common hallmarks I see. One of them is that the companies that actually have a strategy 
uh, tend to do better. Crazy, crazy thought here. And I think the real <laughs> problem is a lot of companies think they have a strategy, but what they really have is just a plan. Um, they don't actually have a, uh, you know, like I adhere to Roger L. Martin's. He, he can explain it way better than I ever could. Um, Roger L. Martin's framework for strategy, which is, you know, you define what you're trying to accomplish, right? Like, like what's the winning aspiration? And it has to be, you know, fairly um, um, uh, aspiring. That's why the word is there. And then from there, the, the real heart of it is, uh, you know, like, where are we going to play, right? Like such that we can win. How are we going to win, right? Like, how do you set the battlefield up? How do you go and compete into a space in such a way that you have a competitive advantage? Um, and then from there, you know, really asking yourself, what would have to be true for this to work? The companies that have really thought through that and then built the systems to, to help support it, the companies that have really thought through that are the ones that do the best versus the ones who just kind of go with the motions and uh, kind of pivot maybe a bit too quickly and uh, go after too much of the market rather than systematically uh, trying to penetrate a market and then expand within it. Beyond that, I would say the the number one biggest uh, driver of success is um, getting their pricing right um, and actually having like a coherent strategy that cascades down from the business strategy into the way that they market and acquire customers. And so what that usually boils down to is money more than anything else. It's really, I think the biggest limitation of growth is really just the lack of capital uh, mm. for the most part, which is unfortunate, but that's, you know, that's the way it and goes. Would you, so. would you say that because you're putting a greater emphasis on like paid ad lead generation versus organic or uh, I guess where, where I guess is the money going in terms of lead gen? My head naturally goes to paid ads. Yeah. So paid, paid is great. I, I, I think yeah. paid is awesome. And, and I come from a predominantly organic uh, kind of search background, but uh, I think over time, if I've, as I sort of evolved in what I've seen work and, and tried to be a bit more unbiased about it, I've, I've stopped kind of looking at things as pure organic or pure paid. And I just view it all as marketing. It's yeah. how do we get, the, how do we get a message to the market where they are, right? No matter, uh, you know, no matter the, the mechanism that's used to deliver it. Right. I mean, really organic is still paid too. You got to pay people to do it, but, uh, the way I've right. been paid is just guaranteed distribution, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's really just the, the investment and in what it takes to actually, um, not only the creative assets, right. Like having good creative, having good messaging, uh, being able to get the distribution out there frequently enough that you stay top of mind. That's, that's probably the biggest one. Um, when it just comes to the, the pure marketing side. Um, and that's assuming yeah. that you have a, a good offer to begin with. So, yeah, I was going to say that too. I think that there's a huge blend, uh, between or the organic and paid side, because even if you're like really gunning it on paid, if you don't have like organic content and, you know, stuff coming off of your pages and, and, and stuff that isn't paid there, then when you're paid people, you know, do their investigation and like actually check you out online and they find nothing and there's, mm -hmm. you know, there's nothing there, then you lose all credibility with them and your paid sales go down. So you kind of have to have both going, um, you know, to have, I think a, a really encompassed strategy, but, um, you know, I know there are a lot of agencies out there that are, you know, really leaning in on organic because like you said, they just don't have the capital, which is limiting, mm -hmm. um, you know, for the paid side. Um, I, I also, it's great that you brought up offers. Cause I was thinking the same thing really that I've worked with so many agencies that, you know, one of the first questions will be like, what is your offer? What, it, what, what stands you out among the crowd? And they tell me back, I do Facebook ads. I do, uh, SEO. I do web design for X price for X price. And I'm like, okay, that is not an offer. Right, that is yeah. a service and a yep. price. Right. That's not an offer. And there's so much confusion about that out there. Like people think if they, if they have a service and they have a price for that service, that that is an offer. It's not an offer. Like that, there's nothing unique about that. Right. Like what? It's for sure are, not a compelling offer. Right. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> if someone says to me, you know, I do this for this price, I'm like, okay, like, so does every, everyone else for a little bit less or a little bit more, you know, it just, it's like, what is it that you are attracting people to choose your service and your price? For, you know what I mean? So do you, do you find that, that is it just, a, you know, on Legion, is it really offer driven, like the best offer wins, or is it a, a more of a combination of offers and other things as well? Uh, the offers is, is critical, right? If you don't have a good offer, it's you're 
the offer is what will make all investment into any sort of distribution. Um, it, it's a force multiplier on it. So I would focus on making sure you have a good offer first. Right. And that's, that goes goes down to your one. I mean, like read Hormozzi's book, hundred million dollar offers. That'll, that'll yeah. be the playbook on that. But but the actual like execution of it, like really iterating through that offer of how you actually begin to uh, take it to market, get feedback, refine, you know, cut what's wasteful, keep what's great, you know, and 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 stack it as you go. Uh, go through that process, and it's not a it's not something you can do in a week, right? But if you can get that down, then whenever you're running paid or when you're doing organic or when you're doing outbound, right? Like you actually have something that can get people's attention. And I think the thing that's um, a lot of people sort of overlook when they're coming up with an offer is uh, I see a lot of agencies. It's like, Oh, we do a free audit. And it's like, everybody does a fucking free audit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, it's like one, like maybe focus on what the outcome of that audit is, or what is it about what you're going to do? That's different (laughs) from what everybody else can do. And with the folks that we work with, I would say like the two key things that, uh, that are in the offers that work very well are, um, one, they tend to just offer it for free. So they're, they're treating it as a, uh, as a loss leader. Right. Um, and then B they're the way they're stacking things up to continue the engagement tends to be directly tied to revenue of the business. And I think that's where a lot of agencies don't put in as much effort, uh, which requires being in that, in a customer CRM, you know, or or any whatever system they're using to sort of to manage sales, right? And a lot of times they'll say, you know, customers don't want to give us access to that. And it's it's like imagine having a marketing department within a company that didn't have access to the CRM. How would this work? Right. 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 And so the ones that tie themselves to revenue, I think uh, they tend to work the best because they actually have like a uh, a metric that executives care about that uh, will also directly inform whether what they're doing is working or not so they can actually adapt and uh and do what they what every business owner actually wants which is to increase you know revenue and profitability so yeah i think that the reason that the revenue tide offers work so well is because it it kind of complements the bias that's in the buyer's head already like when the buyer speaks to the sales rep or the agency owner whoever's selling for the agency and they hear, you know, we're asking for X amount in dollars, right? They naturally think that that you're just trying to get that get that money out of them, get that retainer out of them, get that get and then and then provide the service and, and run away, like a lot of you know not so good agencies out there are doing, right? But when you tie it to revenue, you kind of say, yeah, we are looking for money, but our money is tied to your money, right? Mm-hmm. Like we do well when you do well, and so it confirms their bias. And then it also gives uh, you a reason or gives them you an incentive to perform well for them, right? Like we make more money when you make more money. So it, it you know, instead of being like, oh, you know, it's 5,000 or in 2,000 or 5,000 and 4,000, whatever the retainers are going to be, um, it's, you know, I, one, of the, one of the greatest, you know, I guess a really good sales tactic that I've heard is really talking about how we don't make our money in this setup fee, in this retainer. We make our money on the back end when we make you successful through our, you know, percentage rev share, right? And then that trust, you know, starts coming in because they realize that you're partnering with them because you want long-term growth, not just for them, but also for you. You know what I mean? Which is, is okay to say, you know, we are our business and we, are, we do want to make money, but we want to make money because you're making money. Yeah. And, and to be clear, you don't have to tie everything to so like performance based, um, I think performance based can work great. I think it's also mm-hmm. a very dangerous slope for a lot of agencies if they haven't um, really dialed that in, right? If like they're not could, good you, at if they're not yeah, good at fulfillment, yeah, yeah, you have to you have to know uh, uh, that it's going to work. And and frankly, if you know it's going to work, charge what you should charge, right? And then offer a guarantee uh, is the better yeah. way to do it. But yeah. I, the way that I look at it is saying like, so here's the thing: a lot of companies out there they go hire agencies who are providing a service, retainer-based services, it's, it's, it's the model that's been working the way it's always worked. So like, just imagine doing that, but where your metrics that you're reporting on or that how you're de- de- determining what you're going to do, how you're going to adjust your campaigns, how you're going to adjust your, you know, whatever um, activities that you're engaging in for this customer. Imagine if you just shift them from things like if you're SEO from traffic or keyword rankings and shit that doesn't matter, right? 
to mm -hmm. actual like conversions to pipeline to revenue, right? Like tie them to revenue. If it's paid ads, it's like tie it to revenue, right? Like if you shift them and tie them to revenue, what's going to happen? One, you're going to, you're going to be able to retain the customer longer, right? So you're already going to be doing what another agency would already be doing anyway. You're just focused on metrics that the executive actually cares about. And since you'll get that feedback loop of what's actually driving revenue, you can make a better case for like what's working. You're going to be able to change what you're doing, et cetera. And so now you're able to retain them longer because you're actually delivering results. Again, I would think of it as if imagine you were going and working in that company as the head of marketing, as a VP of marketing, et cetera, right? Like how would you run the team in order to deliver the results without getting fired? And it's, it's yeah. the same approach. So yeah, long gone are the days where, you know, an agency could share the engagement metrics or the traffic mm -hmm. metrics, um, you know, that click through rates and stuff like that. And, and consider that a win. I think I, most businesses, many businesses are, are well past that stage now. Yeah, and don't get me wrong. Like from the brand side of things, like I still think brands should tie to revenue in some in some way, shape, or form. Like down the road, not directly, but it does influence things. But it also depends on what type of agency you are, too. So let me let me kind of make that clear. There are predominantly three types of agencies. You're either the agency that a customer comes to hire because uh, you solve very unique and novel problems, which is more like a consultancy, um, or you're the type of agency that's been there, done that. You have a system that works you've done it for multiple companies you know how to execute on it they know they want that already and they just want you to do it so that it increases the likelihood that it's going to work right in yeah. which case it can be much more transactional in nature they've determined strategy at that point and they just need you to to do it right and then you have agencies that are what i would think of as you're the extra pair of hands right they've got their own you know their own marketing running they've developed strategy they develop plan they just need people to help execute and so that's agencies that maybe are there to support things like just running the paid media right just doing pure paid media they're not having to do creative they're not having to do you know customer interviews message testing etc and so when i kind of when i say this about tying yourself to revenue again like just think about what type of agency are you where do you fit in the market and don't think that you necessarily have to shift um but just be aware too, if you're on the more, if you're on that side, that's kind of more of the extra pair of hands. You are so you're also more of a commodity. So just be aware of that. Yeah. And I think in the early days, like newer agencies, a lot of them, you're going to talk to people that are looking for all of those, um, mm -hmm. one or yeah. the other, like you're going to, I, when I first started out, I had clients that fit in every single one. I was, I was that same agency for yep. different clients. Some I was the first agency, others, I was the third agency, others, I was the second agency. And, and so and that's a difficult business to run, isn't it? Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, starting an agency, people think it's easy. It's not, there's a, there's a ton of, you know, things that have to go right in order for you to succeed, for your clients to be happy, for the system to continue on and replicate itself, you know, uh, over and over so that you can actually grow. Um, and in the beginning that, that happens a lot where you have, you know, a, a new lead that well, they want to hire you, but they, they want to hire you for this spe specific, uh, you know, consultancy type gig, right. Um, or they want to bring in like an outsourced CMO, the other one, they want you to run, run just ads because they have the creative, they have Google down, they want you to run just Facebook ads, right? Like, and so it, you get these things all across the board and when you're brand new, it's hard to say no to these things because you yeah, want to, uh, yeah, totally. you want to get those clients. So it, it's pretty common. I, I see that newer agencies get a taste of all three of those pretty mm -hmm. quickly as they kind of see which direction they want to head in. Um, so we talked a little bit about lead gen, let's move into fulfillment. So fulfillment I, it is so important because you can get leads all day. You can be closing those leads all day and get a ton of clients. But if you're not providing for your clients at the end of the day, if your clients aren't happy and you're just churning and burning them, it's an exhausting agency to be in. Like it, it is, it is, you're, you're going to end up burning out really, really quick and probably quitting uh, because nobody wants to deal with angry clients all the time and no one wants to con, you know, constantly be losing everything that they're getting. So what are some of your, you know, tips for making sure that you're providing a good service from the beginning? Is it, you know, partnering with people who already know how to do this right out the, the bat? Is it, you know, practicing yourself a lot so that you, you're the one that's learning it and then teaching others? What would you suggest for our audience that maybe, you know, starting out? So, so, I mean, if you're starting out, I think, uh, it depends on where you're starting out from. There's, there's a lot of different ways to approach this. So if you're, if you've got capital, hire people who know what they're doing, but that's rarely the case, right? So 
if if it's if you're the one doing it um or you have yourself and one other person like i think that the one of the easiest things to sort of fix fulfillment is to narrow down what you do and get really really good at it streamline it because like honestly that's where your profitability is like you're like profitability comes in two directions the way i see it one you're either get your pricing right and charge more on the front end and never discount like never ever ever discount it'll kill your profitability um or two you you streamline efficiency so well that you're able to make up for it um you know through margins of uh just being able to produce you know a product or a service for a customer um, um more efficiently but the i mean how to say like if you if you if you're trying to like what we talked about earlier if you're doing the both different things right you're doing consulting like very unique novel consulting where you're solving some problem that you've never solved before but you have the skill set or the know-how to be able to work your way through it while simultaneously running performance marketing or you know video editing or whatever it may be uh, how, like that's your that's going to pull you in very two different directions right because on the one hand you may be able to streamline something around performance marketing or video editing and have a process around it but how do you begin to scope and allocate time for solving unique novel problems that you've never solved before like how do you how yeah. do you properly gauge how long that's going to take or or how much effort or energy or capital is going to require to solve that problem so one thing would be like narrow down what you're doing and just slowly stack things as you get it more efficient. Um, the biggest thing on fulfillment though, too, I think when it comes to people, like if you, if you do begin to have hard people is, uh, we, for the longest time, and, and this is, this is less about just pure fulfillment and operations and more about just how to make shit work better. And for the longest time we chased after this dream of like, perfect utilization or like time, like when we were doing, you know, you're doing time tracking, you're trying to make sure your people are, are, are being utilized properly. And all that ever introduced was just more context switching and more multitasking and no system is perfect. All the PM tools are almost good enough, but none of them are, are, are the best, right? All the time tracking tools, people don't like it. It sucks. You forget it's, you know, it feels the very qualities. micromanagy. It's yeah. And it's, and it's, and the data is never really like hundred percent accurate. It's that pursuit after perfect data. That thing actually just ruins shit for the most part. Yeah. And so, we we shifted and moved away from focusing on that and moved towards a pure flow system. So if anyone wants to remember like the way Toyota does manufacturing, um, it's this idea of like continuous improvement. You work on one thing at a time. Uh, it's you focus in on one thing, you finish it, you get it done, right? Like you're not, it's the, the one of the mantras is uh, the stop starting, start finishing. And mm. so when we began to introduce that, we shifted the focus from managing the workers to managing the actual work and shifted the focus from focusing on utilization, like how utilized are our people to focusing on the throughput. And that was the biggest thing. And I think that's what will help not only your people, but you yourself um, and the customer, because when you shift the focus to throughput, throughput is just how long does it take from the time that a customer buys something right until they get it. So until it's actually fulfilled. And so when you shift your focus to that, what you're focused on is how do I delight this customer as fast as possible, like without reducing quality. And when you shift that focus to what's best for the customer, instead of what's best for how you're managing your own resources, the rest just so far for us anyway, and for a few of the other folks that we've helped implement this, it just sort of falls into place. Um, yeah. it's, it's actually crazy. Like we, the, 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 the effect that it's had on my mental health and some of the, the agencies we work with, it's, it's insane. Like what it's, uh, what it's just done for the the mood of the people uh, throughout the organization from small from small orgs of eight people all the way up to you know 60 to 100 too so i i couldn't agree with that more both both in both cases you want the same outcome you want a yeah. good product delivered in the fastest amount of time as possible so that the client mm -hmm. is happy both are you know are trying to achieve the same thing but one of them creates a lot more roadblocks and creates a lot more pressure and it, just unneeded anxiety and kind of like that whole micromanaging thing. And I actually remember, you know, in one of my uh, last nine to fives back in, oh my God, 2013, I was working with this company and they were so focused on what you said, the, the utilization. They were so focused on what time is everyone walking in the door and when is their butt in the seat? 
How long are they gone on lunch? When do they get back from lunch? Are they leaving early? Did, you know, and it was, it, there was only like, it was, a, it was a young startup. There was like 10, 15 of us. And it was the most high pressure, just BS environment that I've ever worked in. It was so toxic. Everyone was out to get everyone. I, we, I walked in one day and like the bosses, uh, I don't know, number two, I saw her like writing a little note down and I went over, I'm like, what was that? She goes, oh, well, well, he asked me to write down the, the minute that everyone walked in. I'm like, what? what a waste of fucking resources. <laughs> oh my right? God. Like that's what your job is this morning to write down that I came in at nine Oh six instead of 9.00 AM when I'm driving yeah. from 45 minutes away and I hit traffic, not, not about what I did, not my work product, not right. about anything but what time I walked in the door and the, just like it became, I left very shortly after that. It became such a toxic environment because they were just so, you know, consumed with what you said, the utilization side instead of the actual work product side. And it just ate them alive. Yeah. And it's fine if you're working with machines, right? Like if you're in a factory and it's like, <laughs> look, this machine can produce X amount of units, you know, widgets per hour. Sure. Right. You want to like maximize utilization, but you still got to do maintenance and, and downtime on the machines too. But like people aren't machines right? Like we can't be perfectly utilized all the time. If you try to do it, you're going to burn your people out. You're going to make them go elsewhere. Good luck retaining talent, right? And not only that is there's this, so the opportunity cost, right? There's an opportunity cost. There's all these hidden costs that come with when you put your focus on utilization and trying to get everybody to track their time down to the granular level, what they feel like is that they have to, they're going to have like a several different things like in the, you know, going on at once, right? Like maybe they're working on three different uh, projects at once. And that's honestly like one of the biggest problems. It's, it's limit your projects, uh, like get one finished before you start on the next one. Right. Um, it doesn't not necessarily organizational wide. Right. But like, if it's, if you, if you got one person working on a project, they should work on that one thing until they finish. That's, that's the biggest, uh, like hack to really make this work because all that context switching, all that multitasking, there's, there's a lot of, uh, the hidden costs related to the time that's lost whenever you do that or projects just kind of going stale, right? Like it's just like inventory that's sitting in a, you know, on shelves unused, right? Like there's, there are costs associated with, you know, storing uh, that as well. Cause I don't know if I'm sure you ran into this before where you have a project, maybe it kind of went a little stale and then it's, you know, maybe the client gets interested in it again or something like that. And you're ready to pick it back up. You've basically like the the amount of energy and effort it takes to get something like that rolling again that you're not able to charge for, mm -hmm. right? Effectively, unless you have it into your your you you know your your MSA or statement of work, like you've just lost that money um, versus just working it through from start to finish. But and and that goes so if if anyone ever goes into the kind of exploring Kanban um, analytics or things like that, one of the big sort of takeaways that was super uh, just amazing for us was we always used to try to gauge like how much work can we do in this amount of time? Like how much can we actually take on right now? Cause we, we run a consultancy. So we're not, you know, we're not like a, just a, like a shop of, of, of you know, 50 to hundred people. So um, we have to limit and be choiceful about what we choose to take on and when we choose to take it on. And we would always try to gauge and try to figure out, well, how long do we think this is going to take? And you're never right. You're never yeah. fucking right. Like it doesn't matter yeah. how many times you estimate it, you'll never be right. And so we shifted when we shifted to Kanban. The nice thing about it is that um, we there's this concept of what's called a Monte Carlo simulation, and um, I'd run them before, but on the marketing side of things, when we're trying to project things like ROI or you know um, traffic growth or you know uh, you know uh, lead like you know pipeline revenue things like that. And then realized that we could begin to apply it to um, forecasting around time of how long something would take. And so we started running that. And now it's been much more accurate because instead of just kind of guessing from the gut, like, oh, I think this is going to take, you know, uh, 40 hours or something like that. Like now we can just say, well, we have an 80% probability that to complete this many things in X amount of, you know, we can complete it by X date or between now and X date, we would be able to complete, we have 85% probability of being able to complete X number of things. And uh, that's been um, dramatically beneficial from a, uh, the way you allocate resources, the way you decide when you're gonna take on a new customer, like, and a lot of people don't like to do it because they're afraid, well, what if I tell this customer like, hey, we can't start on your project until 
uh, three weeks out. Well, they're usually fine with it. They just want to know like what's yeah. happening. So versus taking them on now and then them not hearing from you for four weeks, right? Yeah. Like, it's way better just to, just to be transparent with them about it. I totally agree. And I, before we move past fulfillment, I did want to say that you brought up a point earlier that, you know, if you have the capital, then just hire people that are great to do the job. So you feel good about it from the beginning. And, and that's a problem with a lot of newer agencies is they don't have that capital right off the bat. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, one thing that really helped me um, in the beginning was, you know, I wasn't, you know, I did digital marketing myself and I was doing digital marketing, uh, for, you know, my nine to fives before I left and started my own agency. But um, I didn't do like high level ads management or web website builds or anything like that. And I wasn't going to learn on my clients. And I don't recommend that anyone ever learns on your clients. That's, that's a terrible thing to do. But mm -hmm. what you can do that doesn't take capital is spend your time before you start cranking out lead gen and getting all these people in your pipeline, take your time and find great white label partners, find yep. people that are good, find great case studies, find people that you know, love and trust that you know, that they're going to do a good job, link up with them, have that conversation and just let them know, all right, I'm going to be cranking up my leads and you are going to be my provider. That way you have that ready to go and you don't have to pay them a penny until you actually have closed the client now to be able to afford them. You take your profit, they get theirs. And now you know that, you know, when that client starts from the very beginning, you're not going to be the one doing it. You can still keep your focus on sales and lead gen for your agency. And you know that it's going to be done well through this company that is a white label partner of yours, right? So, and I recommend that you get a few of them. Don't just get one, yeah. get a few different white label partners that are really good in ads, maybe really good in SEO, really good in web dev, whatever the services are that you want to offer. You need to have a, in the beginning, if you're not going to be the one doing it, then you need to have a white label team in place and know their pricing so that you know your margins when you pitch on the front end uh, and you know it's going to be done well because you've already taken a look at the fulfillment team. And so you have your process in place, you have your pricing in place, and it's not going to cost you any capital until you have the capital to spend. Yeah. Think of those costs just like you would um, paid like media, right? Like a media budget. Um, and so account for them on the front end, right? Those are pass through costs that really should never really hit your balance sheet. Like, I mean, they'll hit the balance right. sheet because you're pulling in the revenue, but yeah, but don't don't account for them whenever you're calculating your gross margins or or anything like that. And so, some uh, one of the agencies um, that uh, grew from, I believe they were around like seven figures when we started with them. Uh, they're doing like around seven eight million. Now they're uh, closer to fourteen over the past two years. And like, that's the primary way they operate. And so, depending on where your skill set lies, right? Like, if you're very good at doing the thing, then become that white label partner, right? Yeah. But yeah. if you're very good at marketing and closing deals and managing people or managing relationships, then partner with white label people, right? Because then you can own the relationship, which is key. And a lot of the people who are really, really good at the craft aren't very good at marketing or sales or necessarily like customer success and, and really, you know, and, and, and the relationships. Side Strategy. Of things. Exactly. Exactly. Well, and so they're good at strategy, but they're not really good at explaining the strategy and the customer yeah. face, the customer side of, of strategy, really. Yeah. Well, a lot of them aren't. A lot of them are good at planning. They're not necessarily, not necessarily the best at strategy because really, in order to do yeah. marketing strategy, right, you have to be you have to be very involved with the business strategy as well. Um, it's a uh, Roger Martin calls it a it's a it's all a reinforcing cascade, right? Like everything mm -hmm. informs one another up and down the chain throughout the uh, organization. So, yeah, absolutely. So we talked a little bit about Legion. We talked a little bit about fulfillment. So the last big bucket here that I want to, I want to hit before we move into some other questions is going to be for sales. So what do you think the winners are doing right on sales? And what do you think everyone else uh, is maybe missing the mark on? There's a lot of different things. I mean, for these seven and eight figure agencies that you're dealing with, do they mostly have an in-house sales team? Are they working yeah. with sales partners? Do they like, what, what's their sales setup look like? Yeah, most of them have an in-house sales team. So they're, I would say what's working the best for them is the fact that they have such good marketing that for the most part, people come, like they're out there creating demand. People know that they exist. They know who they are. They come to the sales conversation already aware of, they have a pretty good idea of, hey, here's what this company can do for me. Here's how they can help me. And they're really there just to figure out, you know, from a, like their sales folks tend to offer, uh, tend to sort of act more from a strategic standpoint as well, not they're there to help guide and figure out like what is the actual thing that we need to do to solve this for them um but yeah it's 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 internal um 
Some are doing outbound, um, but I, I view outbound as just a form of marketing, not necessarily sales. Yeah. Uh, I know not everyone agrees with that, but that's that's the way I look at it. Um, but uh, I mean, beyond that, it's there's a lot of different things. I mean, I think uh, if if you just get marketing right, like sales is just just happens. Uh, uh, there's, it does there's become not like a lot a, easier. Yeah, and I mean, there's a lot of different ways to talk about. Oh, like how do you make selling better? Like, there's a lot of different tactics and things like that. But I mean the thing that probably helps sales the most is like we discussed earlier, just having a damn good offer. So the take, for example, like one of the offers I've seen that work the best is, um, uh, so we were working with a, an agency that does content marketing and, you know, they're out there pitching content marketing services to these uh, SaaS companies. And, and I'm like, you know, these people get hit with this all the time. And I was like, look, I'm like, why don't you just make a list of the companies you primarily want to work with? And, from there, create a piece of content for them and just show them what you can do and give it to them. Um, or ask them like, do you want this, right? And so rather than their cold email being something like, hey, we provide content marketing services just like the other, you know, 10,000 agencies that you've received emails from in the past week, like come to them and say, we made this for your website because we think it's a good piece of content that uh, will help your customers and it fills a gap that you have currently in the way that you're doing your marketing would you like to publish it? Like that's the easiest way just to start the conversation because you're already providing, um, you know, some work. And if they don't want it, then, okay. Like, you know, there's a, uh, there's a loss or figure out if you can't uh, find a way to uh, angle it towards another similar competitor, if you're okay with working with one of them as well. And that's been the, I mean, we're talking above a 95% like take rate on that. So it's yeah. it's crazy what happens whenever you just come to someone and say, I made this for you. Do you yeah. want it? Right. Like to start the conversation. So now are you giving that thing in the actual email? Or are you waiting for a reply to say yes before you give it? Uh, so like we'll give them a link to it because it's no one. Uh, we had some people that were afraid, like, what if they just publish it like without? And I'm like, well, then and you they... sue them for copyright infringement. That's what you do. I mean, that's you're the author of it. You own the asset. So I don't think they're going to do that. Uh, no one yeah. has yet. So, yeah. I, yeah, I, I wouldn't think that that would be a big, big yeah. thing. I was just wondering if they, you were waiting for that engagement first. Um, but it's interesting cause it's like, it's, it's kind of that whole value up front value yep. first, foremost and free. Uh, and then they kind of can see, you know, who they're working with and, and the, yeah. the quality. There's a lot of people there will say, oh, Hey, I've made this thing for you. Would you, would you like it? And they don't show it. And the thing is, is. I've, sometimes every now and then, you know, I get those emails. I'm sure you do too. And I'll just take the bite and I'll say, yeah, send it to me right now. I'm like, you can get it to me in the next 30 minutes. Like, like I'll have a conversation with you and they never do because they don't have it. And we know that. And the people we email know that too. Right. So it's like, look, don't bullshit people. Just if you, if you really want to work with that customer, right. If it's, if it's really a target account that you feel like could dramatically change, like the status of your business, right. Like make it for them and just give it to them. Right. And here's the thing especially if you're starting out, it works phenomenally because once you've worked with a handful of customers like that, like now get testimonials, get reviews from them, et cetera. And now you have the social proof where you don't have to necessarily do that, do the upfront work in order to land the account because you have the credibility backing you up that you are a person who's capable of delivering this type of work. So, mm -hmm. but, uh, but again, like when you're trying to, even the companies that have credibility, when they're trying to sort of enter into a, uh, maybe move up a rung in the ladder in terms of the types, you know, the caliber of companies that we're working with. That's what we suggest them to do is just make something for them um, because you're removing a lot of the friction that would occur with the back and forth. Cause you could tell somebody that you have something, but like the mental energy that comes into like, oh, I got to fucking reply to this email and go back for this person. And just, and, and what if it's just a piece of shit, right? Like, and I have to read it and edit it and everything else you know, or, you know, matter, no matter what type of work you're doing, like, but if you just yeah. come to it in hand, it's the, uh, it's like the whole, like handing the glasses to someone and then asking for them back. Like they have it now. Now they feel like they, they want it. We've seen yeah. that work dramatically. Well, yeah, it takes more is, effort, but. There's definitely a psychological effect that occurs when you give somebody something that they just naturally feel like they want to give something back to you. Um, yeah. you know, when you hold the door open for somebody, uh, that you, mm -hmm. what happens if someone holds the door open for you and you're not at the door yet, what do you do? You run to get there faster yeah. 
because yep. because they're being nice and holding the door open so you don't want to make them wait and so there's that natural they're doing something for you let me hurry up for them uh that it's just it's a naturally occurring thing i, I think in psychology that can play through to sales as well i think yeah, one other thing caldini's uh what principle of reciprocity right so mm -hmm. one uh one other thing i wanted to say before we moved off of sales was um you brought up earlier i think when we were talking about lead gen that it's really important to get feedback um, when you're testing new offers and from my experience, one of the best places to get feedback on your offer is in the sales process. You're going to get a ton of feedback. You're going to get, mm -hmm. you know, and, and right now I have a sales team that does sales for my program and we get feedback nonstop. I'll drop, a, you know, an update to the offer or a new offer. Uh, and my, my closers will give me feedback every day. Well, you know, they said it didn't really make sense because why is this three months included, but then this second month is not included. Like those little little yeah. mechanical things uh, that just, you know, need to make lo logical sense when you're drafting up your offer and you have it in front of you and it looks great. You're going to get real time feedback in your sales process, whether you're just starting out and you're taking your own sales calls, be prepared to write down the feedback that you're getting, right? So that, you know, if someone hits that wall of like, well, this doesn't make actual sense because if you're charging this for this why are you charging this for that like that those little mechanical things in your offer, make sure you write those down because it can make a huge difference. I've seen very minute changes, tiny, what we would, as a business mm -hmm. owner, you would think it's just so insignificant, but if you make a tiny little change, all of a sudden, you know, a lot more sales are coming through because it makes more sense to the buyer. Um, yeah. And when you're the seller, it's hard to see it from the buyer, but you'll hear it right from their mouth in the sales process. Yeah. It's, it's listening for those objections, like a anticipating, but then really listening for them and then asking like, how can I solve this? Right. And do I solve it here or do I solve it after the fact? Right. Like, or do I make it a non-issue? Right. Do I yeah. show them that what they think is an objection is, is not really a problem. And I think one thing to be very, very wary of as you're going through, especially if you're new to this and you're creating offers and testing with customers is like, don't, don't assume that you like, don't, you're not the market. Okay. So like, don't just come up with this complex offer that you think everyone's going to want. Like, just go fucking talk to people, right? Like, and they will tell you what their problems are and you can figure out, hey, sometimes you're going to look at it and you're going to say, I can't solve all those problems. That's fine. Can you solve one of them? Solve that. Solve one around it. Refer people to other people and or white label that work, right? Like, um, like, like take that approach to things, right? And then um, in addition to all that, also make sure that when you're getting different, like varying levels of feedback from customers about what they, what they're interested in, what they see value in, what they don't see value in one, understand that it may be a, a, uh, just a, a factor of framing the way you framed the offer itself, the actual like language of it. Um, sometimes you can just change the language and it completely changes their opinion of things. And then two, it could very well just be the way you've segmented your market. A lot of people don't segment their market properly. So like, segment your market and see how it resonates across different segments before you go just shifting an offer across the entire market, right? Like imagine if, um, this may be a little more esoteric here, but like, it's, it's like, imagine if, um, I'll look at like what Bud Light has done, right? Like across <laughs> different, uh, across different segments, right? Or any yeah. like large sort of, um, you know, uh, consumer, you know, CPG company, like there's a reason why there's Veet and there's a reason why there's Veet for men, right? Yeah. Like, it's, you know, just, it gets more granular, to, um, yeah, you know, depending on the service that you're offering, but don't go shift it like across all segments, uh, kind of test it in between and then figure out which yeah. segment you really like working with the most and is most profitable. So that's good advice. When you're shifting things, don't, I think in simpler terms, don't make a bunch of changes all at once because you're yeah. not going to know which one works. If you, if you change everything all at once, then, you know, some things may work, some things may hold you back and then you may end up at net neutral. And you have no idea what did it. So I, but I, I wanted to say that what, what you said about you are not your market. Mm -hmm. I experienced that so much, but not in the, in the way that you are talking about in like with my own clients as an agency owner yes, yeah. who deal, who, who I have clients and they have clients and constantly we're building, um, you know, you know, funnels and ad creative that's targeting our clients' clients, right? Yep. And then our clients will give us feedback before the, the creative is launched. I don't really like that. Or I don't really, you know, it doesn't really, you know, speak to me or whatever. And we, we constantly remind them, well, we actually didn't write this to speak to you. We wrote yep. this, you know, you're a creative minded agency owner 
um, you know, that, that, you know, is over here. We're writing this for a roofer who's way over here, um, completely different uh, types. And that is something that, you know, biz- us as business owners and agency owners need to constantly remember, you know, the product that you're producing for your clients is really for you know the purpose that they're using it for which in most cases is their clients and whoever they're targeting so you have to kind of take a step back from your own bias you have to kind of remind your clients of that bias uh and and just keep along you know remember that as you go through the process there's a ton of bias that comes in like with us as marketers and not only like what you're talking about when it comes to messaging right like we think you know i see this so often around like this whole like You know, we're trying to get super lofty with our messaging or super lofty with the, you know, the, the creative and et cetera. And it's like, look, you just, you just sell a fucking oven, man. Like, (laughs) you know what I mean? They don't need to have a ayahuasca (laughs) experience. (laughs) Yeah. Like you're not, you're not, you're not saving the world here. Like you're just helping people bake. And so it's like, look, the, the, whatever you're helping people sound like, just remember like to them to the end consumer, like you're just a blip on the, of the day. Right. So like, don't, don't overthink it. Like you're just wasting your energy. Instead, just be very clear with people. And here's what we do. And here's how we can help you. Like, you know, and there's, there's other factors with the pricing and, you know, uh, positioning and all that, but we overthink that a lot of times. And then not only that same thing, this is across all of marketing. It comes when it comes to distribution, this, this obsession, like, we grew up in the area of, of quote unquote digital, right? But it's like, look, everything's fucking digital now. TV is digital, radio is mm-hmm. digital, billboards are fucking digital, right? Yeah. Newspapers digital, digital, and so like we have this bias towards uh, a lot of times to again like of like, oh, here's the platforms everyone's using, right? It's like look at like with ChatGPT right now, where we're all like, you know, it's just it's everywhere, right? But like you go look at the at the at the total market and. I think it's eight percent of people have actually used ChatGPT, and it's like, well, well, welcome to the fucking planet, right? Like, yeah. not everybody is a marketer, you know, yeah. or is in on the tech side of things, and we, we have to live remember in that sometimes. We all live in our own bubbles and our own eco, you know, echo chambers. That you know, we're hearing a lot of the same things. What would you say is the clearest difference between a six-figure agency, a seven-figure agency, and an eight-figure agency? Oh. Honestly, they're all very, very close. Um, it depends on like where you're at on the on the eight figure mark. So, I'd say it's kind of like zero to a million. It's um, it's just figuring out what the hell it is that you do and be able to do it consistently. Um, like and being able to like focus and th- th- that's the biggest difference there to, uh, amongst them. You mean like, like a they, re- they, building like repetitive they processes? Don't have it. Not so much repetitive processes, just but just being like, this is I'm very clear about here's what I do, right? Like like I don't we don't see that as much in the zero to one million. Mm. Uh, sometimes you do, and and if you do, they get to one million very fucking fast. I had a friend who literally they just made one very special type of like a looker studio report that had to do with HubSpot, went from zero to a million in like three months. Right. Like they did I'm sorry, they did what? They literally just made like one specific type of report for people in Looker Studio that blended some data together, kind of like doing an ETL pipeline, oh, uh, took okay. that out of HubSpot, blended it together with another external data source. They were doing the database on the back end, put together in a Looker Studio report. They had it dialed in, very simple, right? Like it's very simple, single product. It's just this data studio or Looker Studio now report and went from zero to a million um, in like three months just because they had something that people wanted. There was like a value yeah. there. and you know, and they were able to, uh, they had a, a large tan because of it. So I don't see that oftentimes amongst the, uh, the people kind of get to 1 million, they're trying to do everything. Right. Yep. Um, and then I'd say like 1 million to 7 million, it just kind of comes down to, um, it's really just, it's just advancing, like getting your message in front of more people and just being consistent with like, whether it's through your marketing channels or, whether that's outbound, whether that's paid, whether that's organic, whatever it is, right? It's just being very consistent um, and starting to hire like the right people, uh, like finding who your number two is going to be. Like if you're a, you know, the visionary creative type person, like find your operator. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're an operator, you probably didn't start the business to begin with. Um, you may have though, right? Like either way, I think you, you kind of need both to balance it. Um, going to eight figures and beyond, a lot of it has to do with, uh, so far the ones I've looked at, it's really just 
the only factor that we've seen, like when we run data is, is a, their pricing structure. Um, and it's not necessarily offering more services. It's just the way they structure their pricing. Um, and what they're investing into marketing, um, and, or like sale, right. Depending on how you want to look at it, whether it's outbound or, or any sort of like paid or, or things like that, but it tends to start to get into paid, um, you know, definitely at that point earlier on even, yeah. but, uh, yeah, that's, that, those have been the biggest things because like a lot of people try to refine their processes and their systems way too early. Um, and they haven't really identified like what's the total size of prize here? Like what's the total addressable market for the service, you know, for what you're, what you can sell here and what's your total serviceable market that you can actually, you know, go and claim. Um, that's actually probably like the number one thing is like, what, what's your actual size of TAM is the biggest thing, but, but also like how aggressive are you at new, at net new customer acquisition? Um, a lot of people focus on retention and they, they, they have this like, there's like this false belief that uh, I'm sure you've heard it before. Like, uh, like you can get more value out of a current customer. It's like five X or some shit. Um, like they say, like, like try to sell into your own existing market, retain customers. They're more valuable than net new customers. Like I, I hear this a lot of times. That's complete and utter bullshit. Like that's, that's not true. That's based off of a hypothetical study from the 1980s. Oh, wow. That, like that, like was never even done. And was just like a thought experiment and completely ignored the fact that there are costs. It assumes that it assumes that the cost of delivery is zero. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so the people just kept fucking quoting it. Right. So like, yeah, yeah, no net new customer acquisition is, is the way that you actually grow is get more fucking customers. So a hundred percent, there's something to be said about upselling current customers and that being an easier sale totally. than totally. a new customer, yes. but there are a lot of other factors in that. And you're not going to go typically, you're not going to up a love figure. You're not going to go from six to seven or seven to eight, just by upselling existing customers, unless you're like kind of already on that edge maybe, and it could take you over, yeah. but it's not going to take you from a hundred thousand to a million or 1.1 1. 1 to 10 like that. No. That's, that's not going to happen. Like, like, unless you already had something that had a, like what I would think of as like a consumable type of service, right. Already. Like that's the way, um, you know, you can, you can kind of grow that and, and, or if you have any sort of service that would naturally get more expensive, um, and, or like, like, you know, they're going to have to pay more as they grow as a company, right? Like mm -hmm. that's a way to do it, but, um, but not necessarily through things like, you know, the, the money that gets spent on like half the time, if you're spending a shit ton of money to retain a customer, you're probably better off letting them churn and getting a new customer. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's going to be a lot better, right? Like, and um, yeah, because it's just it, it, trying to increase the frequency at which people buy. Um, it's very hard to change habits. So like, unless you're offering either a, a new service, uh, like, because then you're, you're not selling to the same cut. You're yes, you're selling to the same customer, but you're selling them something very different. Right. That's, that's one thing. Right. But, but trying to, um, you know, when you're investing money into like everything around retention, um, again, I'm not saying like, like you, you want to retain customers. Sure. Absolutely. But, but there's a, there's a, there's a balancing scale there, which it tips to say, like, don't focus on retention at the cost of net new acquisition. So, yeah. So then takeaways, the biggest difference between six figure and seven figure agency is going to be figuring out what you do and what you do best and really refining your offer, refining, you know, who you're targeting and what service you're providing at what price and making sure that is all honed in. Then from seven to eight, the biggest difference is really scaling out your marketing. So once you have your offer down, your pricing down, your fulfillment down, and you're able to produce a great product at a good time and replicate that over and over, then you really just need to scale your marketing and put more into that so that you get more clients into the system and that you can kind of grow mm -hmm. up that way. Is that, is yeah, that right? About, yeah, it's just about getting your message in front of more people, getting more at bats effectively, right? Like that's the way that, uh, well, at least amongst the companies that we work with, that's that's like a key key thing that they're doing. They spend um, usually on average, it's about four point, it's like four point seven to like five point three x more um, than the companies who are not quite growing at the same rate that are growing, you know, um, on a much more kind of 
flatter path, right? And or some rescinding. So it's just the investment in, in, in customer acquisition. So yeah, well, not, this not episode... raising the cost per CAC, right? Not saying that like, you know, but, but, but just increasing the volume. Yeah. This episode has flown by uh, really fast. We didn't even barely get like halfway into the the questions I was going to ask you, but we do have, the, I do have one more question that I ask sure. everyone that comes on my show uh, to, to end the episode. And that question is, what is your number one piece of advice for a brand new agency owner who is just starting out today? Sell one thing to one type of person and like, just focus on one channel to be able to acquire them. Like just, just do that until you get to seven figures. Um, and that's, uh, I heard Layla Hormozzi talking about that. And I said, yeah, yeah. that's what we've seen too. It's hundred percent true. Just it's focus. Yeah. It's complete, complete focus. But shiny object syndrome is uh, rampant in the entrepreneur expensive. space. It's expensive Exp as hell. Yes. Yes. I mean, I, it's funny to watch the, the marketing industry with everything that like shifts, like click funnels, go high level. And then they're, yeah. they're uh, uh, Ch chat GPT and like crypto uh, NFTs. It's just like, just watching the industry, just like chase its tail constantly. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, if you don't find your thing and just stick with it, regardless, like even, even things that are saturated. I remember when I, I started my agency in two, technically two, 2014, but really we started, started establishing ourselves and our foothold in 2015. And I remember, you know, in the, the years that followed the four to five years that followed, all I heard was just how saturated digital agency spaces, marketing agencies are just a fad. And like, it's just like, it's like, it's like drop shipping. It's like other, you know, Amazon FBA and all that stuff. And yeah, there were parts and periods of time over the last, you know, eight years where it has, I could, cause I would consider it quote unquote saturated by, by a lot of people looking at it. But if you are confident in what you do, you do it well, you provide a good service, that saturation moves. It, it's, it's, it's it went from agencies, it went over to crypto and over to NFTs. It's on, now it's on go high level. We just want to resell, you know, GHL. Like if you stick at what you're good at and stay there, that saturation problem, it disappears because the market or the, the fads move. If you're, if you don't, you're good. Yeah. It's the, anyone who feels like they're in a market that's saturated one, just like go learn a bit about category design and try to figure out like how to position yourself, uh, you know, differently. But then two, just remember that it's only saturated if everybody else is really fucking good at what they do. And most of them aren't because they're too busy hopping back and forth between all these different things, uh, because they think that's what the market wants, uh, because it's like, they get it. Well, like we talked about earlier, they get enticed by it. Right. But for the most part, the market's just like, look, we're just trying to run our fucking business and sell our shit to customers <laughs> too. You know what I mean? So like, yeah, it's 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 just being. Uh, no one knows. It's like the it's like the kid who goes to college who fucking changes their majors nine times, right? And you're like, hey, look, you'll figure your life out eventually. So, like, like I would love to see what percentage of 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 adults ended up working in the major that they chose in high school or college. It's like probably like less than ten. Like we all. We all go different yeah. places. Skylar, thank you so much uh, for joining us on the show today. It was a very informative episode. I know that for a fact because I didn't make it through like 90% of the other questions that I had for you because we had such a great conversation. So again, thank you uh, for hopping on and joining us today. Thanks for having me on, Tyler.